So uh, we've seen from the pictures uh, of the chap dropping the ink in that uh, uh, rotating flows are very different and two-dimensional from uh, three-dimensional flows. So let's just look at this in a bit more detail now. So if we go back to the basic equation of motion, uh, I'm looking at the two terms which are actually crucial, the biggest terms uh, in the equation of motion. Remember, we're, we're emitting the Lorentz force. We're in the sort of slow and steady regime here, so we're emitting the inertia at the low Rossby number approximation. There's no inertia gone in there, and we've got the buoyancy emitted too there. So this is the very simplest kind of balance that you can get. And this is called the geostrophic balance. And a geostrophic, a flow which has, uh, satisfies this is called a geostrophic flow. And it's very important, of course, in uh, weather prediction. Uh, you'll all have seen the famous charts, of course, uh, where you typically have a low pressure area and higher pressure out towards the edges. Uh, and you might expect that the high pressure fluid would all flow in, push itself in like that, but it doesn't do that at all. It actually goes round and round, and it goes round and round in a particular way. And the cyclones go anti-clockwise in the northern hemisphere, so the flow goes round and round in circular patterns. Uh, and those circular patterns are because the gradient of the, of the pressure is, is, is perpendicular to the velocity. So the gradient of the pressure is out in that direction, and the flow has to be in that direction. And the omega vector, of course, is out of the board. So that's a geostrophic balanced flow. Uh, and these things, so the flows that we were seeing in that experiment uh, were all of this kind. They were basically geostrophic flows uh, in which the velocity uh, was independent of the z direction and balancing the pressure. And so that balance of pressure versus Coriolis is called the geostrophic uh, balance. So let's now go away from that. Let's sort of add in terms one by one to see what sort of effects are produced when you start dropping some of those assumptions of slow, steady flow and no buoyancy and no magnetic field. So the first one I'm going to do is to restore the d by dt term. So that in the vorticity equation, remember that was uh, uh, the... I'll just flip back just to show you. That was the full vorticity equation, so I'm now going to keep that. I'm dropping these nonlinear terms for the time being, uh, and I'm going to get, rule out all this lot here. So we're just going to keep that one and that one, and let's see what we get out of that. So I'm allowing the uh, vorticity to be time dependent, and if you take the curl of this equation, uh, then you'll get a, a formula for the curl of the vorticity. Now the curl of the vorticity, of course, is the double curl of the velocity, and curl curl is grad div minus del squared, so you can replace that by del squared. So that produces a del squared u term, and when you take the curl of this, you get a zeta, because that's the vorticity. And because it's minus del squared, then you have to change the sign for a plus there. So there we've got two equations. Now, between these equations, you can actually eliminate uh, the vorticity zeta. So if you take the time derivative of that equation there, um, then uh, you'll get a, a, a term like that. And then you take a time derivative, you get a d zeta, d zeta by dt, which you replace by that. And you get that equation there for the velocity. And that is a form of wave equation because it's got a second derivative in time and a second derivative in space over there. And these are called inertial waves because the inertia here is, is important in them. Uh, and <coughs> let's think about what this, the actual picture that's going on in here. So <coughs> the way to think of this is that we think of our vortex lines like stretch strings, just as when you've got a magnetic field, you think of it as a stretch string. Uh, and then if you pluck that string, if you pull it out sideways there, it doesn't like that. You're, you're stretching the vorticity here. This is sometimes called the vortex stretching term, because <coughs> in order for it to be non-zero, you've got to have a velocity. So suppose we look at the z component of this. So if the velocity here is going up there, and it's going down there, so we're moving the fluid like that, we're stretching the fluid out like that, and then we're generating lots of vorticity. 
So basically what we're doing, we can think of this as 2 omega as being some planetary vorticity that due to the rotation itself, um, there's a vorticity everywhere in, in the fluid. And those vortex lines due to the rotation are being stretched and amplified and increased by this vortex stretching mechanism here. So we can think of the vortex lines as being stretched. So when you pull them sideways, they also get stretched um, because they don't really like being stretched. They want to bounce back, but they don't do it quite like alphane waves. And an alphane wave, if you, pull it, if you pull a magnetic field like that, it just goes straight backwards and forwards like that. If you pull a vortex line out like that, what it does is go round and round and round and round <laughs> rather than going backwards and forwards. There's a slight subtle difference between uh, an inertial wave and an a alphane wave. So once the tipping will make is that uh, <coughs> for rotation, you squeeze it, then you increase the moment of inertia differently. Yes, 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 you can think of that way too, yes. If you stretch it out like that, yes, you're essentially decreasing the rotation, so it's like the ice skater. You're, you're locally increasing the angular momentum, and so you spin faster, yes? So you go round and round. So that's, yeah, that's the same idea. Um, the Coriolis force in a rotating fluid is what, what makes the angular momentum being conserved, actually, so it's another way of thinking of the same, same thing. So we've got this wave equation with these, these inertial waves, and it's quite an interesting, uh, uh, it's slightly different from the wave equations you've probably seen because the usual wave equation is just like on a stretch string where you just have the second derivative of the displacement and you have the second derivative there and nothing else. We've got this extra del squared term here which makes life a little bit more interesting. But we do the same as you do for any kind of wave. You look for a solution u naught e to the i k x y x k y y k z z minus omega t, and you bung that into the differential equation, and you get the dispersion relation, the relationship between omega and the wave numbers k, where k is this k squared is just the sum of all the squares of the individual wave numbers. And the nice thing about the rotating thing is it's got this k z squared on the top. Now, let's think about what does kz small mean? Well, kz small, of course, are motions where the wavelength in the z direction is very, very long. So these are things which are hardly being stretched at all. And in the limit, uh, as kz goes to zero, that's a motion, a Taylor, Proudman Taylor type motion, i.e., the whole vortex line is just moving around. And that's got zero frequency. So that's why you get slow, steady motions have the um, have, uh, have kz equals naught. Those are the geostrophic motions. Uh, so if we make kz slightly non-zero, we start waving things around so that instead of being slow and steady, they then have these inertial waves. So if you take a geostrophic system and give it a little prod, uh, what actually happens is you'll get a whole lot of inertial waves excited. Those will eventually damp away or they may radiate away. Uh, uh, and, and decay, and then you'll return to the geostrophic state. So um, that's, uh, and the frequency in general for an inertial wave is of sort of the same order as 2 omega. So if this is sort of order 1, so if the, if the wave numbers are just sort of randomly distributed, uh, then the waves will have a typical frequency of twice the rotation rate, which is very fast for the Earth, of course. That's 12 hours. So a typical inertial wave in the Earth's core would have a period of only some hours or days if the kz is small. But you do get some slightly longer period waves if you make kz as small as possible. So if you go for these type of motions, which are almost geostrophic, uh, then um, you can get periods which are a bit longer than a day. But you're never going to get periods which are hugely longer than a day, obviously, from that formula, unless you make kz actually equal to zero. And of course, if viscosity is restored, then the waves are damped. So, yeah. So, the perturbations are perpendicular to the omega? Yeah, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. So, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, yes, I'm thinking of pushing, uh, making a perturbation to the fluid, which is tangent, uh, um, uh, right angles to the, um, to the rotation vector, yeah. And then, it, then it'll go into this, 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 this inertial mode oscillation. Yeah, yeah, but the way to think of it is always in terms of vortex lines and vortex stretching. That's, that's, that's much the best physical picture to have in your mind. Now, let's uh, forget about the d by dt term, and let's see what happens if we put back in the buoyancy term, which is an interesting thing to do, because uh, 
We haven't thought about that. Now, that's the Boussinesque buoyancy equation. So the uh, G, G is the gravity. We uh, model the temperature variation by 1 minus alpha T, where that's the coefficient of expansion of the fluid. Uh, so that gives us some buoyancy there. So we do the same thing again. We take the curl of the equation and see what we get. Uh, so now we get an equation which tells us uh, that minus 2 rho naught omega du by dz is equal to the curl of uh, G alpha T in this, with, with this, this, this in the, that direction. Uh, sorry, I lost it. Oops. Uh, and this is an interesting equation. We, the the interesting, most interesting component to look at is when x is in the eastward direction. Uh, so that corresponds to a flow which is east-west, like those flows on Jupiter we were looking at before. And this tells us uh, that the rate of change of the east-west flow with height uh, is equal to the rate of change of the temperature uh, in the latitudinal direction. Because we're going to think of, if you think on the Earth's surface, we usually take x to be in the eastward, y to be northward, and z to be upward. So this is telling us that if there's a latitudinal temperature gradient, then we're going to get a, a, a wind, uh, which is a function of z. And this is called a thermal wind, uh, and it's responsible, it's mainly responsible for the jet stream uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. If you probably know that if you fly from uh, America to Europe, you get there much, much quicker than if you fly from Europe to America, and that's because the pilots spot where the jet stream is. They get their aeroplane up in the jet stream, and whoom, off they go, saving lots of money. <laughs> so um, that's, the, that's the way it goes. And the way it works, you see, is that um, it's, ux is pretty well zero in the boundary layer at the bottom, close to the surface. And then as you go up, uh, it gets steeper and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you go up. And of course, so then you run out of air, of course, and you run out of, of stuff. But uh, if you go as high as the aeroplanes can go, then they catch the jet stream as fast as possible. Now, if in this picture here, it should be exactly a sort of east-west uh, line. But of course, the actual temperature, masses of cold air, some come down there, and masses of warm air come up there. So the place where the temperature gradient actually occurs moves around. Um, the UK weather forecast has just discovered about the thermal wind equation. <laughs> and, they, uh, and they've just discovered about the jet stream. And now all we get is predictions about what the jet stream is. You listen to the weather forecast. They've stopped telling you whether it's going to rain or not. <laughs> what they tell you about is where the jet stream is. They're very excited by this. They say, oh, look, the jet stream's going up there. That means it's going to have stormy weather in a week's time. Well, anyway, there you go. <laughs> but, uh, so that is the, uh, that's uh, the way that buoyancy actually operates on, the, uh, on these flows. So that's a nice example of... of Sorry? The Z is upwards, up upwards, yes. Y is, in the, is in towards the North Pole. Y is latitudinal. Yep, so Y... Uh, ro yes, yes, rotations in the z direction, yeah. That's a bit of a cheat. I mean, that would be, ri that would be right at the North Pole, but because the Earth's atmosphere is a thin shell, then it's only really the Coriolis component. It's only the Coriolis component in the r direction which really comes into the equation. I, I mean, that's, that's an additional complication because that's, it's actually a stratified um, uh, layer in, because, of the, because it's thin uh, in that direction, and that's why... The other components of rotation don't come in. I mean, you're quite right. I mean, if you, if you, look, if you did that properly, you'd find an extra uh, component there which gets balanced by the, um, uh, by the pressure force, the, the vertical pressure force, basically. Uh, so that's the, um, yeah, and so that, that's about the jet stream. So that's a nice way. So that's the thermal wind equation. And that's important in the Earth's core, too, because uh, we believe that there are similar temperature differences. We think that the uh, polar regions are actually hotter in the Earth's core rather than colder because that's where all the buoyancy is coming out of the inner core boundary, if you remember the basic picture I had. So um, it's quite hard for fluid to move sideways like that because of the Taylor problem of strain, the problem Taylor constraint. So, um, uh, yeah, so it tends to be, the poles tend to be hotter. So there's a, temp uh, a temperature difference which goes the other way 
from that on the Earth, and that tends to produce an anticyclonic vortex uh, in the polar regions, polar caps of the Earth's core. And there's some evidence of that. There's some evidence that the magnetic field is being swept around. There's some papers being written on that. So, uh, yeah. So now let's go. So that's given you the flavor of the basics of rotating convection. So now let's have a look at the theory. So much the best book to look at if you want to understand about plane layer models, whether they're rotating, not rotating, or got a magnetic field in, is Chandrasekhar's classic 1961 text. I don't know how he manages to write quite as clearly as he does. It all just flows completely logically. No steps are omitted. Everything is explained. Uh, and somehow it's just, it's just magic, really. <laughs> then you look at all other books, and there's all a mess, because all the ideas are all higgledy-piggledy all over the place. It's something to do with having a very logical mind, I think. And perhaps that's how you win Nobel Prizes. <laughs> anyway, so that's... Um, that's yeah. Why are you Sorry? Why are you linear? Why are we looking at linear? Because we want to start with linear theory. I mean, the first place to start with is, is in all these problems is to look at the linear theory because it's simple. You can actually solve it. Uh, you can understand it. And it then gives you a framework in which to look at nonlinear effects. I mean, if you just dive into nonlinear stuff, it looks like a mess. And then you never quite sort out what on earth is going on. If you understand the linear theory properly, then that's a huge advantage because it gives you a frame of reference of what is expected in those circumstances. And then you can see nonlinear things. Oh, we can see, oh, look, the nonlinear effect has come in here, or a nonlinear effect is happening here. And that gives you a, a way of describing what's actually happening. So it's much the best to start with this. And as I said, the book is, is Chandrasekhar, Hydrodynamic and Hydromagnetic Stability. Um, it's in, it's in, that's the original one. I've got Paul Roberts's copy, actually. but. Uh, um, uh, the, there's a paperback version of the more recent that's very easily available so that's the basic equation of motion and the temperature equation and the buoyancy and the continuity equation for a Boussinesque fluid are written there and by the way Chandrasekhar very clearly explains exactly what Boussinesque means uh, of course and so all these things are in there and the method of analysis is we write down these equations we've dropped the nonlinear term u dot grad u We've dropped the nonlinear term u dot grad t prime there. Uh, those are the only two in the basic plane layer, non-rotating, in the basic plane layer stuff. And so we take the curl of this equation to get that equation there. Uh, <coughs> um, uh, yeah, that's the z component, because the z component of the curl of that is zero, because it's in the z direction. And then you take the z component of the double curl, so you take curl and then curl again, and you get this equation, which I, that and that, remember, were the vorticity parts that we saw before. Uh, and now we bring in the horizontal gradients of temperature because the double curl of this is non-zero Z component, and then there's the vorticity here, uh, the viscosity here. And then we uh, simplify, look for solutions. The simplest is to look for stress-free constant temperature boundaries because then the solution can be written down analytically in exact form, uh, and then you bung all that in and you get your dispersion relation which looks like that and that looks a bit complicated at first and it is a bit complicated but uh, if you actually play around with this and plot these things for against A uh, and sigma for sigma against A uh, for different Rayleigh numbers you begin to get a picture of what that actually means it takes a bit of time to play around with dispersion relations and these dimensionless parameters turn up which are very important this is the Ekman number here uh, the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number. So Ekman number is essentially the ratio of viscous forces to Coriolis forces, ratio of buoyancy forces uh, to diffusion, and the Prandtl number is the ratio of the viscous, viscous diffusion to the thermal diffusion. So we end up with this little dispersion relation, and we can ask ourselves, um, when does convection first onset? Because since disturbances go like e to the sigma t, if sigma is positive, uh, these grow, and if sigma is negative, the disturbances decay. So everything stays stable if sigma is negative, but as soon as sigma is positive, then convection starts to go, motion starts overturning. And it's also possible to have sigma complex, 
Uh, and in that case, it's whether the real part is positive or negative tells you whether that thing actually grows or decays. So the first thing is that for Prandtl number greater than one, we typically get steady modes on setting first, and I'll talk about those mostly. So we look at the point at which they first onset, and that's called the critical Rayleigh number, and that's a function of the wave numbers A and the Ekman number uh, in that formula there. So that's a formula which tells you what the critical Rayleigh number for the onset of convection is as you vary the Ekman number and the wave numbers A. Now, disturbances can have any wave number you like, so what we're interested in is trying to find the lowest value of the Rayleigh number over A, because um, since all disturbances will be present initially, it's the ones which uh, grow fastest, quickest, uh, which you're going to actually see, and those are the ones that are found by optimizing uh, RA over A, i.e. finding the minimum of RA as a function of A, differentiating this formula with respect to A and setting it to zero. Now, in general, it's quite complicated, but if you let epsilon be small, uh, then you can work out quite simply that the critical value of A occurs with that formula, and it goes like e to the minus one-third. So the wave number gets very, very big as the e gets very, very small, and that means the column sizes get very, very thin. So large A corresponds to small wavelength, so that corresponds to tall, thin columns. Uh, they're tall because the Z dependence is just a simple cosine or a sine, depending on whether you're looking at the temperature, uh, the vorticity, or the Z velocity. So the columns have to be tall and thin. And in the small E limit, you can work out the critical Rayleigh number. And it's given by that formula there, which is also in Chandrasekhar. And you can see that it's got E to the minus 4,000. Now, E is very, very small. So this is actually enormous. So that means that we don't get any convection at all until the Rayleigh number's got to quite a big value. So that's another effect of rotation. It delays the onset of rotation until you've got to quite a large Rayleigh number. And then it will start to convect. And it'll start to convect in tall, thin columns, as predicted by the linear theory. So the linear theory does exactly what you want. And these are all numerical simulations of plane layer convection by Stefan Stelmach. Um, who's got a very nice code, which does these problems. So that's the layer there, there's the bottom layer, there's the top layer there. Um, in the numerical codes, we always assume that it's got some kind of a periodic, we don't have an infinite box, we have to assume it's somewhat periodic in that direction and in that direction. But that doesn't matter too much, provided that the length here is very long compared to the length of these individual columns, because there are lots of the individual columns inside them. And there you can see, I mean, in this calculation, you're close to critical, uh, and the Ekman number is very, very small. What do you expect from linear theory? Tall, thin columns. What do you see in your calculations? Tall, thin columns, which is all very satisfactory. And um, there are some are blue and some are red, and they're colored whether they're sort of, whether the fluid's sort of circulating upwards or circulating downwards. So it sort of goes up and then down. And then it's sort of interesting to think, well, what about nonlinear effects? Suppose we put the nonlinear terms back in again. What are those actually doing? And now you can see that. I said, it gives, this gives you a framework. So that's where you start from, linear theory. Then as you go more supercritical, as you increase the Rayleigh number, still get the columns, but more sort of mess starts to develop, typically in the boundary layers, the top and bottom boundary layers. Then, uh, as you go up in Rayleigh number, well, there's still some columnar structures present there, but it's becoming a lot messier. I mean, they're not going all the way up to the top. They're not going all the way up to the bottom. And then eventually, if you make the Rayleigh number sufficiently large, it's just a complete mess. There's lots and lots of small-scale convection, and it's actually pretty much the same as if there was no rotation at all. And the reason for that is, as you increase... Rayleigh number, you're increasing u. So if you're keeping omega the same and just increasing u, your Rossby number's going up. And we know that when Rossby number is bigger than one, it's essentially non-rotating. The, the, the Coriolis force is hardly doing anything at all. So just by stewing up the Rayleigh number, uh, you get to a regime where the rotation 
isn't so important. So that's an important thing. Rotation will only last so long, but it turns out that in planetary dynamos, they're almost all in this rotating, well, there's some argument about whether we're there or there, actually, to be quite honest, uh, in, in planets. Um, but we're certainly, um, we're certainly at pretty small uh, Rossby numbers. So these are mostly boundary conditions? But these are, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that calculation, Stefan's calculation, has actually got no slip boundary conditions. Uh, it doesn't make it, well, this picture here is much the same, whether it's no slip or stress-free. Um, this, this stuff here, these columns there, you don't see those so much in stress-free because those are due to Ekman layer effects, boundary layer effects, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit in a minute if I've got time. Uh, so, so the boundary conditions does make a bit of difference there. Um, but, the, but, but, it, but it's still recognizable. It, it, in either stress-free or no-slip, you tend to get columnar structures. Uh, now, this is a, a view... Yeah. It, uh, well, not so much, actually. By the time you get to Rossby number order one, um, they are more to do with the boundary layer thicknesses, which is what, the way rayleigh baynard convection works. So it's, um, it gets a bit more complicated. But that's, those are nonlinear questions and quite hard. So um, this is, uh, this is a, another picture of the same thing. This is from... Uh, some of Céline Gavilli's uh, uh, calculations. Céline is a postdoc working in Leeds with us. Um, and so that's a horizontal slice of the axial vorticity. Yeah, and you can see all the small columns rising, uh, going cyclonic and anticyclonic uh, there. And if you look at the Z structure of that slice there, you can see that it's got uh, a very columnar structure. And that's at E is 5 times 10 to the minus 6. And a moderate, that's a Rayleigh number just above critical, less than twice critical there. So a multitude of small vortices, elongated structures with horizontal size decreasing with Ekman number, um, mid-plane antisymmetry of the, of the axial vorticity. That's, that comes from the fact that the axial vorticity goes like cos pi z rather than sine pi z. Uh, what actually happens if you increase the uh, Rayleigh number? Uh, well, this is sort of some of the interesting things that happen in rotating fluids, which we're only beginning to explore. Uh, during the growing phase, um, a lot of the red stuff is somehow beginning to merge together. And over here, we've um, got what we call a large-scale vortex, or LSV, which is a large cyclonic, it's red, so it's cyclonic vortex, so that the individual vortices have all clustered together to give you one big, strong vortex. I think this has got a m movie with it. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, that's during the formation phase. You can see that it's all going around, uh, dominated by that uh, cyclonic vortex there. And you can see all these little vortices here being advected around. Uh, as it moves along. So that's during the formation. It takes a long time for this thing to form. Um, oh yeah, that one goes too. And um, that's it in full flow, so to speak. There, there this, the cyclonic vortex has been created uh, and all the anticyclonic eddies are being, uh, are being evected around. And there's a big shear layer here. So these, this is a, an LSV. This is for stress-free boundary conditions. Um, we're not sure whether it works so well for no-slip boundary conditions. That's something we're trying looking at at the moment. Chris, what's the time scale for formation? Oh, well, that's run for about a thousand rotation times. So, I mean, that's obviously slow. That's, that's quick compared to the viscous diffusion time, which is very, very long. But it's, it's sort of somewhere in between there. It's, it's many, many thousand of rotation times before you actually get that kind of vortex structure uh, forming. And in fact, I think some of the other people who've looked at this have sometimes um, not, run it, not, not, run it out, not run it for long enough. Um, yeah. Is there some shear in the flow? Uh, no imposed shear in the flow, no. No, it's absolutely classic stress-free boundaries, rayleigh Baynard. Yeah, with rotation. That's all there is in that. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, well, you have to read the paper. It's uh, <laughs> Gavili, Jones and Hughes, uh, December 2014. Yes, JFM. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, they'd always, it always grows to fill the box. So well, however, all these things, you have to make the box periodic, yeah? And however big you make that box, yeah, it will always eventually grow big enough so that one huge vortex... Yeah, you never end up with two. You know? uh, well, yes, but it's not quite as simple as that. If you read the paper, it, there's a bit more to it than that. <laughs> I'm not saying any more of that. But that's the structure, that's the vertical structure there. It's, it's really quite interesting, but it, it's a bit... I can't get through it in the time. I mean, it's a whole seminar in itself. Okay, so now let's think now about heat transport. So this is measured by something called the Nusselt number, which I think we mentioned before. So the Nusselt number, I'll write that down over here just in case we've forgotten. So the Nusselt number is the convected flux. So it's F convected divided by the, um, uh, no, sorry, it's uh, F total flux here. So it's F convected plus F conducted, with some flux conducted along the uh, temperature gradient, divided by the F conducted. So this, if, even if there's no fluid mo motion at all, of course, uh, there's some uh, heat conduction because the top bottom is hot and the top is cold and it's a conducting material, so there will be certain heat flux. And that goes on the bottom there. And then the top is here is the conducted plus the... Uh, convected. So this has always got to be greater than 1. It's exactly equal to 1 uh, when you're close to critical and then uh, as, as you build up in Rayleigh number, so it goes up. So these are the pictures from experiments from King and Arnaud and people in, uh, on the west coast of America. Um, and you can see what happens. This is the non-rotating one, so that goes off. This is a log plot. And that curve there has got a, a gradient of about a third, just slightly less than a third, actually, somewhere near two-sevenths, actually. Um, so that's the non-rotating curve there. So it builds up and it goes up and it increases. You get more and more heat transport as you increase the Rayleigh number. Now, along here are the rotating ones at various values of the Ekman number. So at 10 to the minus 3, you get a delay before anything happens, and then when it starts, it goes up quite steeply, and then it moves on to this branch here, because the Rossby number has now got to be order one up here, and so it's essentially non-rotating. Then increase or decrease the Ekman number to much smaller values, and you, the onset goes back and back and back, and then it goes up very, very steeply here, and then uh, merges on eventually to, to the non-rotating. So inevitably, a large enough Rayleigh number, for fixed Ekman number, it becomes non-rotating. So, but all these curves here are, are the rotating bits, and this is where we think the planets are actually lying on these curves down here, because the Ekman number is tiny, so they're a very long way along there. And the Rayleigh number is pretty big, uh, but it's, it's somewhere down there, somewhere off on that part of the picture. So there we are. So that's how, the, that's how this actually works out. It would be nice if we could predict these slopes, um, but that's a job for you guys. <laughs> uh, we, we've tried. I wouldn't say we've tried and failed, but uh, we're making some progress. But uh, nevertheless, as I said, that is a gap. That's basically one for you lot. Uh, yes, it's suppressing convection. That's right. That's why you've got to go to a higher, higher, higher Rayleigh number before anything happens. Yeah, before you get any heat transport above the conducted one. Uh, but then once you get there. Up it goes really quite fast. So they, once these columns get operational, they can actually transport the heat quite quickly. Yeah? Uh, and that's why these gradients here are quite steep, um, much steeper than this gradient here. Uh, that's, uh, as I said, that's one for you guys to work out and explain in detail. Right, OK. So that's all I'm going to say about plane layout. I want now to talk about um, the next problem in the sequence. Why is it called plane layer? Oh, because it's got no sloping boundaries. I mean, in, in oh. a, we're, planets all have sloping boundaries because they're in spheres. And as we'll see, those sloping boundaries make quite a big difference. So um, 
the plane layer is sort of okay at the polar regions, yeah? but as soon as you move away from the polar regions, it's not really right. So, I mean, it, it's only a good model for the polar regions. It's also a good model for understanding about the dynamics of rotating fluids and rotating convection, actually, which is the main reason why we're really interested in it, because it's the, you can solve it more. The linear theory is easy, analytic, possible. The numerics are much faster than in the sphere because of the existence of fast Fourier transforms. These are all done by spectral methods, I should have said that. The codes which do these calculations, produce all those pictures, are spectral methods, uh, and they're based on fast Fourier transforms in all three directions, in the X, Y, and the Z direction. And because that's really fast, then you can get to quite high Rayleigh numbers, you can get to low Ekman numbers, much lower than you can in a spherical geometry. So if you really want to understand the dynamics of convection at really high Rayleigh numbers, really low Ekman numbers, plain layer is, 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 is the best. Can't do better than it. However, this is pretty good too, actually. This is the Busser annulus, uh, and this also can be solved very fast too, for reasons which I'll explain. Um, uh, so we've got these sloping boundaries, and I say it captures many uh, features of the a rapidly rotating sphere. In the Busser annulus, the gravity is going in this direction because we're sort of thinking of it's, it's modeled when we were having those centrifugal uh, experiments where the centrifugal force was replacing the gravity force. So um, the Z component of the equation, of the vorticity equation, now becomes this. And there's our vortex stretching term, duz by dz. It's always d by dz because omega is in the Z direction. Uh, since the gravity is in the y direction, perpendicular, yeah, that gives us that, that dt by dx, so it's now picking up on, uh, 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 on gradients of the temperature in the x direction or the eastward direction. And so the buoyancy drives the z uh, vorticity directly. So whereas in the plane layer, it only, do, it only goes into the second curl, uh, in this, then you get uh, a buoyancy term directly in the vorticity. So as I said, it drives the vorticity directly. And that means that we can do some tricks. Uh, well, Fritz Busser could do some tricks. You integrate over the column length as they, uh, uh, in the z direction. So you get that equation there. And because that had du by dz, you can actually integrate that. That just becomes uz at the top minus uz at the bottom. And then using the boundary conditions, you can rewrite that in terms of uy. And that little angle chi comes in there uh, because on the boundaries, uz is equal to chi u uy. And that's very important because on a normal plane layer, of course, we'd have uz equals naught here. Uh, and then that term would disappear when you integrate it. And that's thoroughly bad news because that would lose the rotation altogether. But by this cunning trick of having this small slope here, um, you've got um, the rotation back into it. Uh, okay, and there's physics there, of course. On that s sloping boundary, uh, think of a vortex line. Now, if we move in the UY direction here, yeah, okay, outwards, then we're either stretching it or compressing it. So the rotation is doing something. It's actually doing vortex. Stretching. Therefore, um, the rotation actually comes into the whole analysis. Therefore, this gives you an idea of what's happening in... Uh, in rotating spherical convection. So we get that rather nice equation. Uh, and since the motion is pretty well two-dimensional, as we've seen, um, we've got, uh, we can rewrite this in terms of a stream function, and then the vorticity is related to the stream function, the z vorticity is related to the stream function as minus del squared h, and this enables us to get one equation for the whole works. Um, so we can get a, a vorticity equation the nonlinear vorticity equation. Now, the vortex stretching, the rotational term has now appeared in that beta parameter. The temperature goes much the same as before, and the Rayleigh number, and this beta parameter, which is like an inverse Ekman number, uh, actually turn out from the system. And this is nice because this can be, uh, this has got a nice simple solution, just like uh, the Chandrasekhar stuff had a nice simple solution. Uh, so if you just drop the nonlinear terms, first of all, look for solutions like that. Then we get the imaginary part of the dispersion relation. Turns out that we must have omega non-zero now. So in the Busser annulus, all the waves move, um, they propagate. So basically what's happening is these vortex stretching 
as it stretches in and out like so, as it fluid moves in and out like that, it also propagates around. So these are vortex waves in a sense. So they're moving out like that and it's moving in and moving out and moving in all around that uh, cylinder. So uh, there we are. That's, some, that's the dispersion relation, yeah? And it's so the frequency goes proportional to beta here. So it's got to, so the faster you rotate, the faster this thing will propagate. Uh, and the Rayleigh number goes along with this formula. Uh, and as I said, the restoring force comes from the sloping boundaries. And omega over k has to be positive. So these Rossby waves, as they're called, travel eastward. Uh, in shallow layers, there's uh, another kind of Rossby wave, uh, which is slightly different because the vortex stretching works slightly differently in the Earth's atmosphere because there's a thin layer. And the difference means that those ones travel westward, whereas in the Busser annulus, uh, the Rossby waves travel eastward. And you can solve this to work out the critical value of K, which I think I've done there, yeah. So it's rather similar, so the K is very large if beta is large. Remember, small Ekman number is large beta. So beta large means large k. So that means tall, thin columns again. So just as before, we're getting tall, thin columns uh, in our, our, our annulus model. But this time, we have this frequency here, which actually scales like beta to the two-thirds once you take the k effect into account. And the Rayleigh number, again, uh, goes up like beta to the four-thirds. So if the rotation is rapid, that's big. So you only onset when it's really ra rotating really fast. Okay, so that's exactly similar to the plane layer, so that's good. Um, and uh, this one also forms interesting structures when you go nonlinear. Uh, this is a, um, a movie which I made some time ago. I'll just explain about the coordinates. So this is the x direction there. This is the y direction there. So it the K it was in the X direction, so those are the tall, thin columns. You can see they're fairly thin and they're quite elongated in that uh, direction. Uh, and so these things are carrying heat out um, from uh, this side up to that side, basically. Uh, and they're rotating around, so these things are transporting heat. Uh, and they're driven by the convection uh, in the annulus. And... Um, well, let's have a look and see what happens. Um, so you can see that you get some pluses, uh, which are the sort of red uh, with the yellowy things, and the minuses are the bluey things. And you can probably see that these, uh, this two-dimensional flow is doing another of these inverse cascade things, which two-dimensional flows like to do. It's getting into it's some kind of a large-scale order is coming out of the initial small-scale chaos. You can begin to see sort of structures, banded structures, beginning to appear, uh, just like we saw on Jupiter. And I think this movie goes, it takes quite a long time. That's quite a good thing, in a way, because it tells you that these, uh, these organized structures take a long time to emerge, um, but you can see that they do and eventually this thing will go to something which is actually just got straight blue bands and uh, yellow bands and blue bands and yellow bands. And the number of bands, of course, is another interesting question. Do you want to make analogy to Peter and the heating is in the radial direction? Uh, well, the, the heating is in the radial direction, but it's m well, the m most important aspect of the heating is that it's across the, ro the rotation axis. So if we're now thinking, say, near the equator of Jupiter, yeah? So we've got our vortices are going around like that, and the heat's coming out like that. So on each vortex, this might be a little hotter, and that might be a little colder, and that's going to twist the vortex around. That's how the buoyancy actually generates and keeps the vorticity actually going. And then that takes the heat out towards the equator. And of course, also, there is also an, a, mo a motion which is not represented in the animus, which is the, v the vertical motion. So they will also be spiraling up and depositing heat near the poles as well. So, I mean, this is a simplified version, but you can see the nice thing about it is it actually has this property of getting uh, coherent structures out of um, things which didn't look very promising at the beginning. 
So that's the Busser annulus. What's the difference between quasi-geostrophic? Uh, quasi-geostrophic model is quite popular at the moment because 2D simulations are much less expensive than 3D simulations. Uh, and uh, in QGA, instead of making this assumption that the angle chi is not is small, we, we, we get away from that. We just say whatever it is for a sphere. So we make it a varying function. Now the disadvantage of that is this is no longer asymptotically correct. The nice thing about Busser is that in the limit, kappa, chi goes to zero, all the equations are asymptotically correct. So this is only just an approximation, this QGA, QGA model. It's not exact. Um, but nevertheless, it seems to do a pretty good job, actually, when you look at the simulations. Uh, it seems to be pretty similar to the simulations from the sphere, at least, so long as you keep away from the tangent cylinder or, or, and you don't get too near the equator either. It's best at mid-latitudes. Uh, this is one of Emmanuel Dormy's pictures. I hope he recognizes it, yes. Uh, uh, so this is the onset of convection in a sphere. Uh, and these are the columnar structures that we've been talking about here. And this is a sequence at different uh, Ekman numbers getting smaller and smaller and smaller uh, as we go there. And you can see the columns are getting thinner and thinner and thinner. But a new thing has turned up here, which we didn't see before, and that is the columns they're no longer um, just sort of ordinary columns, sort of circular columns. They've got this slightly curious spiraling structure uh, moving out like that. And the real origin of this is because in the Busser annulus, we had a frequency. If you remember, there was a definite frequency moving that omega, which we, we predicted and had a neat little formula in terms of beta and k. And that was appropriate for the whole... Um, for a thing of that particular slope. But of course, in a sphere, uh, it's sloping much less up there and sloping much more up there. So that means that that local phase speed, that local frequency, is different at different uh, values of s, distances from the x. In particular, it gets larger as the slope gets bigger. So these Johnnies here want to go faster, and these ones here, they want to go slower. But of course, the whole thing's got to keep its act together. It's actually got to go around at the same speed. So what it does is it chooses a speed somewhere in between uh, and moves, uh, and then these ones start trying to move faster and these move slower, and the net effect is that the thing is actually uh, producing this spiral structure out in this, this way. Okay, so that's what happens in uh, rotating spheres. That's the uh, uh, cut in the... Uh, we're looking at the equatorial section there. Um, there's an asymptotic theory that goes with this, and that's the bottom. And the top is the numerical calculations, and the purpose of that picture is to show that this is the same as that, and that tells you that our asymptotic theory is jolly good. Um, so that's how uh, that actually works out. And you can see this one, there's an inner sphere here, and these things are moving out, but they've still got this, um, uh, this spiraling structure. Uh, as, as you've got there. Sometimes you can get them, uh, these things sort of sitting in midair, so to speak, in the middle of the layer. If the inner core is quite a small thing, it will come out, as, as Busser sh showed in the original thing, that it first comes on set sometime in the, in the interior. Okay, so, um, right, yeah. So, the last point of this, no simulations can actually reach the very small Ekman numbers found in planetary cores. Now, that's an important thing to remember. Um, Ekman number in the core, Earth's core, 10 to the minus 15, much the same in Jupiter, Saturn is even lower, if anything. Uh, and, um, gosh, so really, really small Ekman numbers. What can you do com computationally? Well, in a sphere, well, Andy's got some things down to 10 to the minus 6 and slightly below, but that took several years of computing didn't it, in order to do that. So it's, it's okay to do it once, but it's not a not, not sort of thing you can repeat very often. Um, 10 to the five, minus 5 you could do in a sort of few days, and that's what people tend to use in spherical geometry. Those Stelmach things were at 10 to the minus 7 in plain layer, and that would probably have taken a couple of days too, I would guess, uh, but not much more than that because of the great speed up because of the... Um, um, fast Fourier transforms that are available in these simplified geometries. So, um, what are scaling laws about? Well, the idea is 
you look at your simulations, you reduce the E as much as you can, you look at which direction things are going in, and you try to extrapolate uh, along to the E very, very small limit. And of course, that's okay, so long as nothing dramatically new happens um, at some rather small Ekman number <laughs> below which you can actually compute. So that's the idea of, oopsie, that's, uh, uh, better go back to this. Uh, but again, that's the idea of scaling laws. Uh, but it's also possible to look at the terms in the equations of motion to actually get a balance and sort of do some sort of estimation work, which will also give you uh, a physical arguments based on the various force balances of inertia, Coriolis, buoyancy, Lorentz, and viscous forces that are actually occurring in these simulations. So let's have a go at trying to do this. This is different from everything I've said so far. Everything I've said so far is in some sense almost exact. I mean, the, the, the plane layer, the sphere, they're all precise mathematical problems which have precise mathematical solutions. Um, or at least uh, they have asymptotic solutions which are asymptotically correct in certain limits. Now we're, we're in the sort of, sort of more arm-waving mode here where we're just looking at the terms in the equations and trying to decide which things are going to balance which. So the convective heat flux can be given by that. So in an arm-waving way, we can write approximately equal to or roughly equal to. And these are supposed to be typical velocities and typical temperatures. So in a simulation, you typically take the root mean square velocity and the root mean square temperature fluctuation in order to work out what those are in the simulation. So we expect the convective flux to go like that. Then, uh, in strongly nonlinear convection, the balance is basically between inertia and buoyancy if it's not rotating. So, if there's no rotation, we expect a, a buoyancy, a balance of inertia to, uh, to, to buoyancy. So, we can almost think of these as blobs of fluid just accelerating up uh, due to the buoyancy and then going a certain distance and sort of smashing uh, and releasing all their heat to the surroundings. And the distance they go is this mixing length, d. And in compressible convection, d is usually taken as the density scale height. But in Boussin S convection, it's usually taken as the distance between the boundaries. So it's an approximate value. Uh, and then you get from balancing up these terms here, you get that balancing that. So you can then multiply the u star up there. And you get the famous uh, mixing length theory, which is actually it seems to go back in the fluids literature to Deerdorf, who did some experiments uh, and came up with this as the typical velocity in terms of the heat flux uh, that's going in through. So that's the gravity, that's the coefficient of expansion, that's the heat flux that's going in through our layer. So uh, let's just draw a little picture down here. So uh, there's a heat flux F going in there. In a steady state, the same heat flux is going to come out of the top two. So that's the, that's the heat flux that we're, we're talking about here. So that's basically, the, from this one here, that's, this F is this. So basically the Nusselt number is then uh, F divided by the conducted flux, which is just the uh, temperature difference divided by the distance times the uh, diffusivity, conductivity. Okay, so that shows you there, then that gives you an estimate for U star, which works very well in laboratory experiments in terms of the heat flux. And of course, we can estimate what all these things are in planetary cores. I mean, I talked about 10 terawatts going through the core mantle boundary. So let's put 10 terawatts in as the heat flux. The values of G and alpha and D and rho and CP are sort of known. Uh, so you can stick all those in. Well, I say known, they're known roughly, of course. Um, you can stick all those in and you can come out with a number. If you do that, you come out with a number which is a bit bigger than Andy Jackson's number of 5 times 10 to the minus 4. I think it's nearer 10 to the minus 2, actually, in, in the Earth's core. And you can do that for other planets because we know what the heat flux coming through out of Jupiter is and Saturn and other planets, too. Uh, so if we put something like that, uh, it ends up giving you a U star about, well, I said it's about 10 times too big, yeah. Uh, and that suggests that actually rotation and magnetic field is actually slowing down the convection. So this formula here, which ignored rotation, is probably wrong. Uh, and we need a theory um, which has actually got the rotation in it. 
and this is called the inertial theory of rotating convection. And I haven't really, I never really chased up the, the pedigree of this. I mean, it's been reinvented numerous times by people working not unaware of what's happened before, in a, usually in a totally different field. I think Stevenson and Ingersoll and Pollard seem to be all fairly early uh, in the field. You can always tell whether the guys will get the right answer because there are magical one-fifth powers will come up soon in a minute. But the idea of mixing le of the inertial theory of, uh, is that we now have a three-term balance between the inertia here, so that's inertial, that's where that comes from. So, but now we take account of the fact that we have tall, thin columns. So we have a long length scale in that direction and a much shorter length scale L perp, which represents the column thickness uh, in this length scale. And this one here, well, the vorticity is dominated, the Z vorticity is dominated by gradients in this direction, so it's the small length scales that come in here. That's why we've got L perp squared there. But the vortex stretching, that's happening on the long length scale, so that's why the D is in there. So that's the long length scale, and that's the short length scale of the actual convection columns comes in there. And the buoyancy, well, that's driven by, it's hot on that side, cold on that side, this thing's going around, so it's the short length scale that comes in there. So that's the short length scale in there. And then when you go, oopsie, you know, down, 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 this thing. <laughs> that's, uh, whoops. Uh, it was, yeah, that was that one, yes. So that, that's the, um, that's it. Um, we're ignoring the Lorentz force. So the inertial theory of rotating convection is just what it says. It doesn't have magnetic field in it. So uh, we've got L purpose uh, going like that, yeah. And if you work that out in the Earth's core, it's rather small, unfortunately, it's four kilometers, which is actually telling you really that the magnetic field is important because on four kilometers, uh, magnetic field is, is below the dissipation length in, in, of magnetic field. So um, it is basically telling you that you can't really do this in, in the Earth's core, although people are actually doing it. They are actually ignoring the rotation in order to get their scaling, the magnetic field to get their scaling laws, but it's certainly somewhat wrong. But it might not be fantastically wrong, because, I mean, the dissipation length from the magnetic field, of the size of the magnetic structure, smallest magnetic structures we expect, are not that much bigger than that. They're just a bit bigger than that. So this L perp has got a special name. It's called the Rhine's length. Uh, and it's that, so it's uh, got an easy uh, representation in terms of u star d and omega. Uh, it's all, yeah, yeah, and it's the balance of inertia and Coriolis. So, uh, so on, on, it's balancing inertia and Coriolis in that way where we've got these particular kinds of uh, lengths. So that's the small length scale and that's the large length scale. Okay, so that's that. And then we can eliminate to get a formula for the heat flux. So we can get estimates for, for the heat flux, for the uh, actual velocity in terms of the heat flux. So that gives me the Rossby number, which is very small, of course, because this is typically much smaller than that. Uh, and that gives me something which goes with these two-fifths power law, which, as I said, is, is the hallmark of the inertial theory of convection. It's whenever you see these fives that you know what people are talking about. Uh, and for compositional convection, you can replace this by an equivalent of buoyancy flux. And this fits quite well with numerical simulation, so that you get the two-fifths law here. Well, it came out, the experiment was 0.41, which is very close to the inertial scaling. Uh, and so this predicted velocity can be compared to the westward drift in the Earth's core, and it doesn't do too badly. I mean, it, this is actually significantly smaller than the mixing length value, the non-rotating value. Uh, and that's what we want, because as Andy said, that it looks like it's more like 5 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, and that's not far off what you get out of these kind of estimates. So they're not completely crazy, even though they do ignore the magnetic field here. But it, I mean, it's probable that the magnetic field is doing important things. Oh, that seems to be where we stop on that one, so I'm going to the last one now, which is sort of more about numerical results and models. So let's just go up a bit, a little bit quicker here. We've got half an hour left, haven't we? Right. Okay, so almost everything I've talked about so far 
has had no magnetic fields in, which might seem odd for a dynamo-based meeting, but understanding the non-magnetic case first, I think, is a very good idea, actually, for everybody. I would strongly recommend always think about what happens with no magnetic field as well as what happens with magnetic fields, and then you can compare. Again, it's all about getting a reference state. So you, you have an idea in your mind of what you're expecting, and then you have a reference in your mind as to what the differences are going to be when you add in the extra, f extra effects. And this gives you, you can then build up a whole coherent picture instead of just being in a chaotic muddle. Okay, so what happens with linear theory uh, when we impose a magnetic field? Now, close to the onset, it's slow, so the imposed field isn't much changed. But there is a first order perturbation to the basic magnetic field. And the Lorentz force typically opposes the stretching of field lines. So, like I said, like the vortex lines don't like being stretched, so the magnetic field lines don't like being stretched. And we can do the Chandrasekhar plane layer problem, which has got the magnetic field going uh, vertical. If you want rotation, that's going vertical as well, uh, and the plus and minus temperature on that. And this actually leads to oscillatory mode straight away with magnetic field and rotation. So um, I think I can go through this. So we had this pretty thoroughly covered last time. So I think I'll just go through all that. So we got to the uh, induction equation, was covered pretty thoroughly last time. Uh, so um, uh, we've got the convention of magnetic field and rotation. Uh, surprisingly, magnetic field can reduce the ro critical Rayleigh number in rotating convection. Now that's a surprise to a lot of people because on its own, magnetic field, all those stretch strings going there, they block the flow, they push the Rayleigh number up, when, with the vorticity there, the vortex lines, that pushes the convection, uh, the critical Rayleigh number up. You'd think that putting magnetic field and rotation, these would somehow add together and you'd get an even higher critical Rayleigh number, but that's not actually true. What actually happens is that these two effects almost can cancel each other out uh, and end up with a lower Rayleigh number actually occurring. So that's a quite a, an, an important uh, result. Uh, it's in Chandrasekhar, of course. But there's been a lot of other work, too. Roberts, um, El Tayeb, uh, David Fern are all people who've done a lot of uh, groundbreaking stuff in this, this field. And uh, basically, we've got to go have a, a, a measure of the magnetic field strength. And the measure is called the Elsassa number here. So that a large Elsassa number has a strong Lorentz force this is basically Lorentz to Coriolis. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, so if the Lorentz is much bigger than Coriolis, lambda will be big. The Elsassa number is large. And small Elsassa number corresponds to the weak magnetic field case. Oh, it is the magnetic diffusivity. Yeah. Oh, yes. That, that also comes in. And the, yeah, that, well, yeah, it does. Now, that's a very interesting question because... People have asked, why should that come in, really? Because, I mean, you've, you've got a homing across you and you're balancing a thing. And, I mean, that comes in if you make the additional assumption that your um, RM is order one. So if you make the RM order one assumption, yeah, then you get that balance. And that's what's been done in order to get that thing. Recently, that people have been looking at this. They have now what they call a dynamic Elsassa number which is much closer to the direct comparison of omega cross u against um, the Lorentz force. And um, that dynamic Elsassa number turns out, when you're nonlinear, to be a better measure. For linear theory, this is perfectly OK, because you've got a basically, you do have a balance between the diffusion and the dynamo, the induction, when you're, well, when you're close to it. Large RM, are, this isn't so useful, exactly. A large RM a dynamical rate, uh, LSS. And I think I've got a transparency somewhere. I, yeah. Yeah, in fact, yeah, we're, we're just coming off up onto this, in fact. That was the next, my next thought. Um, as I said, this works okay, but one of the things that's been noticed in the simulations is that the large length scales that you ex expect when you... Oh, I should have said about the large length scale, sorry. Um, uh, the magnetic field breaks the Taylor crown constraint, and instead of getting those tall, thin columns, uh, you get thicker columns become possible. So that instead of having that 
k going like e to the one third, e to the minus one, e to the minus one third, which gives you those very uh, thin columns, you can actually get wave numbers which are order one if the Lorentz force and the Coriolis force are just in balance. And that means that the, that's the reason why the critical Rayleigh number can be smaller, because we're no longer depending on viscosity. We're balancing, we're getting really, really rid of the tail of the constraint by balancing the magnetic field against the Coriolis force yeah. rather than the viscosity against the Coriolis. Uh, well, you can be, yes. I mean, there have been lots of calculations, actually. In Chandrasekhar, he's got B in terms of omega, yes. El Tayeb did B perpendicular to omega. With Paul Roberts, I did basically all, all possible <laughs> directions in about I was in papers in about 2000. So lots of people have done lots of things. But the basic story is actually pretty similar. I mean, you get, you get different kinds of modes. Sometimes they're oscillatory. Sometimes uh, they line up with the magnetic field. Sometimes they line up perpendicular to the magnetic field. You get all sorts of things happening. Yeah, all, all the time you have a critical rating number. Okay, so that's it. So uh, it's been noticed, though, that you don't tend to get these thicker columns uh, coming up in numerical simulations. And people have been wondering about this just recently. And I think the real reason is because it's this dynamic l Sasser number, which is exactly what I was talking to you there, uh, becomes more relevant when you're strongly nonlinear than the, uh, L or the linear theory l Sasser number, which is the thing within Chandrasekhar. Um, uh, so this thing becomes more important, and that's slightly different because it's different by a factor of Rm, which is sort of a few hundreds or maybe even almost a thousand inside the Earth's core. So uh, this generally predicts that magnetic field doesn't actually make a difference until considerably stronger magnetic fields than the ordinary l Sasser number. Yeah, 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 yes. This one doesn't seem to... Oh, oh that's funny. This, these pictures don't seem to have come up at all. I don't know why that is. But uh, the thing that, the, what this shows you is what's called flux expulsion. So if we stir that um, uh, vertical field line there, field lines there, and put a, a circulation on there, then the field lines get stirred up there and stirred up more. And by this time, all the field is in this thin boundary layer and there's essentially no, fluid, uh, no magnetic field in there. And so what we think is happening in these simulations is basically those columns are wiping out the magnetic field. In linear theory, the magnetic field goes right through the middle of those columns. But in nonlinear calculations, then those, those vorticity there is actually expelling the magnetic field out to the boundary. So then it has much less effect actually on the, on the basic balance of the convection. So then the convection goes back to a balance of Coriolis versus uh, uh, viscosity, which is why the viscosity still seems to be important in these simulations, even though the Ekman number is small and even though there's a magnetic field in there. But that, again, is controversial work in progress. So uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting things to do there. Okay, so magnetic fields, just to summarize, magnetic fields can reduce critical Rayleigh number, uh, and they can reduce the critical value of the horizontal wave number, so in spherical, e to the i m phi, it's, redu it's, increase, it's reducing m. Uh, and uh, if the columns are too thin, they won't actually give you a dynamo, so it is important that some uh, mechanism for increasing m is actually there. Uh, yeah, um, now we're going back to looking at the linear theory results here. There's a special field um, called the Malchus field, um, where B is given by B naught S phi hat in cylindrical coordinates. Um, the thing that's nice about this magnetic fi Malchus field is that it's possible to write down analytic expressions uh, for most of the problems that you want to solve, provided that you have, uh, have this special field. Now, of course, it's a particular field, uh, and it's nothing like the field you like to see in planets. But nevertheless, you can see some of these effects here. I've got a few pictures here. So for small El Sasser number here, that's weak magnetic field, you can see the picture is much the same as it was in Emmanuel Dormy's pictures, uh, where we had these thin columns spiraling outwards 
uh, with a very low E. But if you increase uh, uh, lambda, so you increase the magnetic field, there you can see the reduction in the horizontal wave, no uh, wavelength, wave number. So to give you the bigger, bigger wavelength uh, uh, patterns there. Okay, and even a fairly modest uh, magnetic field will actually expand the columns quite a bit. But, of course, for that to work, that magnetic field has actually got to get into the columns. And the trouble is the flux expulsion at high RM tends to stop it ever getting into the columns in the first place. Okay, and now that's a picture. I don't think I need to go too much into that. That's the critical Rayleigh number. And you can see, first of all, it increases with magnetic field, and then it suddenly drops. This is where the magnetic field is actually beginning to balance uh, the Coriolis force. This is sometimes called the magnetostrophic. Geostrophic is uh, Coriolis balancing pressure. Magnetostrophic is Coriolis balancing Lorentz and, and a bit of pressure there too. So, so that's, the, uh, that's the new balance there, producing the lower critical Rayleigh numbers. Right. I uh, thought I had to say something about J.B. Taylor's constraint because uh, that's important in dynamos. <coughs> um, <coughs> the Coriolis term is zero if you have geostrophic flow. Well, when I say Coriolis term is zero, what I really mean here is we're going to consider uh, this integral here. So let's look, uh, concentrate on this. We're looking at cylinders here. Andy Jackson showed some pictures of cylinders there, and they're rather important in this whole subject. So let's consider a cylinder here, yeah, fitting around the inner core there. And we're going to think about integrating the equation of motion or the phi components of the equation of motion over that cylinder. So that integral there is all over that, uh, that um, cylinder there. And if you look at all these terms, um, some sort of rather special things happen to them. In particular, uh, if you look at that, there's no net flux of fluid out of the cylinder or into that cylinder because of mass conservation. So that, that term actually goes to zero. Uh, if it's steady, that term will go to zero. Viscosity, Ekman numbers are always extremely small in the Earth's core, as we've said many, many times. So Taylor's constraint is basically that that quantity there has got to be zero. So that if you integrate over a cylinder, uh, J cross B the phi component of J cross B ought to turn out to be naught. And, of course, a fun thing to do is to do when you do a dynamo simulation is to actually work out what J cross B is and integrate it over it and see if it actually is zero. And, of course, it never is because no, no numerical simulation is, is very exact. But it is noticeable that in quite a lot of the simulations,